My Black Buddhist Lecture today is Anthony F. Elmore Lecture on Black Buddhist History. The Buddha was born in Magadha around 650 BC. All we have to do is look at archaeology, anthropology, literary science, and genetic science, and we can solve the issue of Black Buddhist prickly. The way to shut races down is to simply have them to show scientific evidence of white people on the world stage in 650 BC. You see, during the time of the Buddha Shakyamuni, there was no such thing in Eastern Ethiopia of what we call white people. See, let us go to the history of the region. The people of this region come from what we call today the Indus Valley Civilization. Now, another name for the Indus Valley Civilization is the Harappa. And the largest city in Harappa was Mohenjo Daro. Now, this is the point that how we shut races down. No white people on this part of the world in 650 AC. Now, let us explain why the rediscovery of black Buddhist history is the most important discovery and awakening for black people in modern history. I am the most humble and honored black man in modern history. We get to tell you on YouTube and on the world stage about our rediscovery of black Buddhist history. Let me explain why this revelation is important to black people. This is important because our black Buddhist history contains some of not only our greatest black history, black Buddhist history, but this lecture contains some of the world's greatest history. In our world, we have religious structures we can talk about, like the Vatican and Rome. We can talk about Islamic structures structures like in Mecca, in the Middle East. Now let us talk about the largest religious structure on planet Earth. Now, what we black people can be excited about is the fact that our black ancestors created the world's largest religious structure in Cambodia called Angkor Wat in Cambodia. This is the largest religious a brick or concrete structure in the world. Look at the Buddha at the Bayan Temple in Cambodia. In regards to religion, it is the Hali Canon, the Buddhist writing that is the largest religious work in the world. In regards to black history, it is via the Buddhist religion where we find the largest and the most iconic black oriented artifacts on planet Earth. We talk about Jesus or any other human in the world, however, it is in Buddhism where we find black Buddhist history more than any icons in the world. While we find in Buddhism the most iconic black history on planet Earth, this black Buddhist history is hidden in plain daylight. See, look at most Buddhist statues and what you will see that these Buddhist statues have black hair, like my hair. See, that is the way you tell about black history. Now, we don't see this going our black history, this black history, uh, our black history time in February, but our black history is in any of the Buddhist statues because you see the black hair. Now, the most iconic and clear and irrefutable image of black Buddhist history is the black hair. 
The racists go so far as to explain the hair on the Buddha as snails. They tell the lie that the Buddha was meditating and he was hot and snails crawl on his head to cool him off. You have to go to lie at white races to believe that. White races did their best to cover up and hide black Buddhist history. I read a post the other day where a prominent India wrote that the Buddha statues were black because the wood was black or dark. We can talk about the wood all day long, but no one can argue about the hair. See, it is the hair that presents problems to white races. The most important lesson that black people must understand about black Buddhist history is the word Nagas. The word Nagas is pronounced sometimes as niggas. When you say the word nigger or naga in America, we are talking about black people. In Africa, or Africans of black people, people are referred to by whites as Ethiopians, men burnt skin. One of the oldest documents recorded on black people is the Christian Bible, whereas black people are referred to as what? Kushites. Now, the land of Kush, black people are referred to as Nubian. In the land in Africa today, uh, Ethiopia was also known in ancient times as Abyssinia. The Abyssinia Ethiopian language, the kings are known as Nagas or Nagash. Now, let us get into the essence of black Buddhist history. The Buddhist in early history were known as the Naga. The word Naga means snake or dragon. The snake represents the logo of the Buddhist. The snake is a metaphor in that the snake changes its skin and this represents the year of dying and coming back, the eternity of life. We see the snake with the tail and head, this, this, the, the snake with the tail in his mouth. This represents infinity. We see the snake or the naga as the symbol of medicine. The snake represents Buddhism or wisdom. Now, our lecture again is Buddhist history is black history. If I start my lesson regarding Buddhism in Eastern Ethiopia or India, I will lose some of you. In order to understand that black history, or rather Buddhist history is black history, I will start teaching you from Africa, then kind of move backwards. See, the Buddha was known as the line of the Shaka. And the Buddhist tribe came into Africa from India and they set up a nation. In fact, the Buddha was known, or the Buddhists were known as the Shepherd Kings. And they set up a land in Africa and they were known as the tribe of Judah or the Israelis. Now, this is what Dr. Clyde Winters a noted linguistic say about the Naga. Quote, ancient Ethiopian traditions support the rule of Pantites or Ethiopians of India. The Kibra Nagas, we find mentions of the Ari kings who ruled India. The founder of the dynasty was Zabesu and Gabo. This dynasty, according to the Kibra Nagas, began around 370 BC. These rulers of India and Ethiopia were called Nagas. The Kibra Nagas claimed that Queen Makeda had servants and merchants. They traded for her at sea and on land in the Indies and Aswan. It also says that her son, 
Abner Hakeem Menelik won led a campaign in the Indian Sea. The king of India made gifts and donations and prostrated himself before him. It is also said that Menelik ruled an empire that extended from the rivers of Egypt, that's the Blue Nile, to the west, from the south shore to eastern India. According to the Cuban Nagas, the Cuban Nagas identification of eastern Indian Empire ruled by the Nagas corresponds to the Naga colonies in the Deccan and on the east coast between the Kaviri and Vargao rivers. Uncle. Now, when we learn about Buddhist history, there are two schools of thought. There is world history that is inclusive of black history, culture and language, and there is white and Asian history that excludes all black Buddhist history, culture and language from the Buddhist teachings. We explain that Buddhist history is black history. That is inclusive of our African and Eastern Ethiopian history. The Ethiopian dynasty is the oldest dynasty of kings and queens in world history. No other people can trace their history of kings and queens to 137 BC. Not the Chinese, not the whites, not the Asians, nobody could trace their history of kings and queens to 137 BC. The ancient Ethiopians were called Naga and they go back all the way to the Queen of Sheba known as Makeda. These Ethiopians ruled both Africa and India and they were called Naga. Let us move to Magana Empire where it was founded by C. Su Naga. Please understand that the Africans moved from Africa to India and founded both the Egyptian culture and the Indus Valley culture. The Indus Valley culture had a relationship to the Nile Valley culture in that they were both Naga people. Now, the Naga people in Africa, they were known as Nubian, and in the Indus Valley, they were known as the Naga. Now, the Naga were later known in India as the Dravidian and other names. Now, what is important to know and understand that these cultures, both Africa and Asia, had a family and working relationship. Let me explain. The language of the Brahmins used was called Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit evolved from Ethiopian Gees. We explained to you earlier that the Ari kings ruled Ethiopia. Now the word Ari means serpent, so serpent Anaga. Now, this is what is quoted. Now, according to sources, Ethiopia, this modern Ethiopia, its first dynasty begun by the Kushite pharaohs, including one called Ari or the Serpent King. There is an ancient Egyptian story called the Adventures of Sinbad and it deals with a region from Ethiopia to Kenya and mentions the islands off the Kenyan coast. It also mentions a great king called the Serpent King who ruled over a great empire. Was this punt now, the point you must understand is that India was not outside of Africa or Africans. We have Africans and we have the Africans of Asia called Naga. The Buddha and Buddhists were the Nagas. When we look at the ancient Egyptians with the snake, 
they are the Buddhist Nagas. There is no such thing as what we call white people who rule ancient India. Ancient India was ruled by the black Naga kings until the Shaka era. The word Shaka means foreigner in Sanskrit. Now, please understand that it was during the Shaka era, which should have been called the Kushan era, under King Kamishka, where we find the start of the Hindu era. There is nowhere in ancient texts where we find the word Hindu. There was no such thing as the Buddha being a Hindu. This was a rewrite of history. The Hindu religions are characterized by the Sanskrit language. Please understand that it was under the Kushan King Kanishka, whereas Buddhism was separated by race, culture, and language. It was King Kanishka who changed the Buddha from black to white. Look, let us look at the Ganhara images where the Buddha was changed from black to white. They changed the language of Buddhism from Haskit to Sanskrit. Now, let us connect India back to Africa. Now, listen very carefully and get your notes. You see, in 185 BC, there was a Brahmin general by the name of Push Yamitra Shunga. Now, he killed the last Muslim king, Reed Hadatra, in broad daylight. Now, Push Yamitra created a cult, and he put a bounty on the head of any Buddhist monks. Now, the Buddhists had to leave India and records show that they moved to Africa. Now, Google this book. It's called, in the book, Philostratus, in the life of Apollonius and St. Jerome. He writes that the gymnosophists of Cush settled near the source of the Nile. He further states, having been forced to migrate after the murder of their king. Now, the word gem means naked and surface means philosophers. See, it was the father of history, Herodotus, who wrote that the gem that Nero, or the capital of Nubia, were the cradle of the gem the surface. Please understand, the information we at the Proud Black Buddhist Association bring to you. See, we bring to you Buddhist history. See, Buddhist history is black history. See, we bring you literary signs or documented writings whereas the Buddha fled the Buddhists fled India and moved to Nero in Nubia and Africa. See, it was Herodotus the father of history, who wrote that Miro on the Nile was the cradle of the Gymnosophist Buddhists, and Buddhism existed before Herodotus even wrote history. Let us explain what happened in India under King Kanishka. Now, this is the first century AD. They created a new form of Buddhism. Whereas they extricated all of the black Buddhist history, culture, and language from the Buddhist teachings. They changed the Buddha from black to white, and they came up with a new language and a new Buddhist history. This is anti-history or anti-black history. You see, the new Buddhism was called Mahayana Buddhism. Now this moved primarily north and west, covering China, Korea, and Tibet. Now let us move to the important and vital point in regards to Buddhism. 
while the Buddhist religion moved into other countries and other nations, in regards to black or African people, the Buddhist teachings followed a concurrent course in that the Nagas, Nubians or Dravidians, or rather black people in Africa and India, were the same family. You see, Buddhism didn't just move from India to Africa, but you see, India was always a part of Africa because it was the Ari kings of Ethiopia that ruled India from Africa. Now, let us move back to the history of the Ari kings of Ethiopia that states, quote, according to the Cuba Nagast, around 1370 B.C., these rulers of India and Ethiopia were called Nagas. Now, when we speak of the Nagas, or people in Africa, the people in India, we are speaking about the same black people. You see, India was not so separated. India was not looking the way it looks today. You see, the whites came into northern India, but they didn't come until years later. You see, please note this chart. Now, there's a chart here. Now, the Guise origin of David Nagari writings in India. Now, in regards to India, it was the African Ethiopians who gave the Indians their writing system. Please note that this writing system was called Nagari from the Naga. See, this is what Dr. Clyde Winters writes about the subject. Quote, there is no Indian etymology that explains Nagari as the name for Sanskrit for the Sanskrit language. It is clear that Devi Nagari means divine city or sacred city or city of God. This is why the term script is placed in brackets in, in your definitions meaning urban script of the deities, equal gods. In other words, divine urban script. You see, the Ethiopian term Nagari was used to represent writings by the inventors of Sanskrit, which was probably used as a lingual franco by the Ethiopians who ruled India and they are primarily in the Indian urban areas. See, a linga franco is a common or a commerce language that means the Devi Nagari equal sacred writings, not urban or deity. You see, in Kenya, there's a language called Swahili. Swahili was a commerce or a city language, and it was the same as Sanskrit was used. Now, the Ethiopian term Nagari was used to represent writing by the inventors. Now, because of the possible origin as a trade language, spoken Sanskrit acquired the name Nagari speech. Since it's probably originated as a lingua franca, it was later written in Guise or some other Ethiopian script. Now, when Panini and others wrote grammars of Sanskrit, they continued to call it by the name given to it by its creator as Nagari speech. Let us understand the clarity of Buddhist history. It was not until 400 A.D. or 1,000 years after the Buddha's death that the Lotus Sutra was translated into Chinese by Kumara Jiva. It was another 400 years that the Lotus Sutra would reach Japan. In contrast, Africans, meaning the Ethiopians, Nubians, Nambas were the same people who spoke the same language. Let us be clear, the language of the Nagas, Ethiopian Keys, was given to the black Indians by their Ethiopian brothers and sisters. We 
have a history of Buddhism in Africa 1,000 years before it arrived in China. Let us get the record straight. Before there was ever any people called white people who practiced Buddhism, Buddhist history was black history. What is the first evidence of people known as whites to practice Buddhism? Alexander tried to conquer India, but he was turned around by the black group called the Nandas. Now the Nandas were later, later conquered by another group called the Mauryans, who established diplomatic ties with the Greeks. Now, the Mauryan king of Soka introduced Buddhism all around to that part of the world. While Alexander did not conquer India, his generals went as far as to Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush mountains. Now, let me take you back to again to 185 BC when the Brahmin general Push Yamitra killed the Mauryan king Bri Hadada Maria. Now, this is the start of what we now know as the Hindu religion. See, there is no such word now listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. There is no such word in ancient writings as Hindu. There was no such thing as a Hindu Buddha because the Hindu did not exist. Now, historically, Buddhist religion following King Kanishka who created a new religion called Mahayana Buddhism. See, it was in the Shaka era under King Kanishka where he killed the spirit of Buddhism when they divided Buddhism along linguistic and racial lines into Hinayana and Mahayana. Now, listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the Mahayanas were the Brahmins and followers of Sanskrit. It was a fight between the black Mauryan kings and the Brahmins. You see, Brahmanism and Buddhism finally split in a language between Sanskrit and Pali. It was from Mahayana Buddhism that grew into Christianity. See, historically, the Buddhist religion following King Kanishka's Mahayana propagation. Buddhism bifurcated from a, a historically black Buddhist, Buddhism to a white Buddhism, whereas it later became what is known as an Asian religion. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the Kushan Buddhist King Kanishka is the absolute most important figure in world history in regards to racism. See, it was King Kanishka who is the father of white hegemony. See, hegemony, I do not use the word because it's too big a word. In strict terms, the Buddhist King Kanishka is the father of white racism, of white culture and pluralism. It is via his new Buddhist style of religion called Mahayana Buddhism where we find the start of world racism and the rewrite of black Buddhist history. Now, see, the era of white hegemony, or what I call White culture and pillars and stars with King Kanishka and Mahayana Buddhism. What does the King Kanishka era mean for black people? This era means the era of white dominance. 
in the eradication of the black Buddhist religion in history and the prelude to the Hindu or Brahman religion. You see, the way that you destroy the history and culture of a people is your language. It was King Kanishka who changed Buddhism from the black language of Pali to the white language of Sanskrit. It was the Brahman Panini who synthesized the Sanskrit language. It was the British archaeologist Sir William Jones who points out that Sanskrit came from Ethiopian Gies. Sanskrit was the language of the Brahmins. Now, let us look at the Gandhara images commissioned by King Kanishka, who changed not only the Buddha from black to white, he and the Brahmin Ashwagosha over a hundred years created there after the first Buddhist council. See, the first Buddhist council, fourth Buddhist council took place in 29 BC. Now, over a hundred years later, King Kanishka and the Brahmin Ashwagosha created the second fourth Buddhist council or what you call the White Buddhist Council. See, the fourth, second fourth Buddhist Council was the ultimate case of white hegemony. And their goal was to rewrite the Buddhist history. They wrote, rewrote Buddhist history via Sanskrit. Now, let me explain to you in a contemporary fashion how Mahayana Buddhism and Hinduism are twins. All you have to do is go to the most recognizable face in modern history of Mahayana Buddhism. The world's most noticed faith is Mahayana Buddhist, the Dalai Lama. Now, the Dalai Lama won a Nobel Peace Prize. Now, the Dalai Lama lives in India, and he is the Buddhist faith of the Mahayana Buddhism. Now, he actually represents the Hindu. You see, on November the 7th, 2004, the Dalai Lama was in South Africa, and this is what he said, quote, Hinduism has a long tradition, and Buddhism draws many practices from the old ancient traditions of India. In many ways, Hinduism and Buddhism are twins. It is the Dalai Lama who teaches that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, was a Hindu. Let us get an understanding how racism started in our world. It is Hinduism that is the mother of racism. See, in Hinduism, you find the word called Varna, which means cult. It was the Hinduism where we find the world's first sanctified racism called the caste system. The whites came into northern India and mixed with the black people. Now, it was the light skin who became the Brahmin teachers. See, it was the northern Brahmins who controlled India and they set up the caste system where it's light skins at the top and the blacks were on the bottom. See, let me explain the history of the Mauryan era versus the Ahsoka, who were black kings, and now we move to the Shunga era on the Push Yavitra. See, in 185 BC, when Push Yamitra killed the William King, he created a cult. Now, he created this cult. Now, later on, we move into the Kushan era. This is in the AD or the Chakra era. 
This is a time when Buddhism changed to a foreigner. See, black people listen to this point very, very carefully. The word Hindu did not exist in any ancient writings or was Hindu anterior to Buddhism. Please understand, the racist hate the fact that all humans come from Africa and the first humans and fathers of our civilization were black people. Race is a social construct and all humans come from black people. Now, the world's first racist theory in history comes from the Hindu religion in India. See, the racist Hindu Vedics created the greatest racist historical fraud in world history. You see, the Hindu created a false writings called the Vedas. The Vedas were a false rewrite of history. When you look up the caste system in India, you read about a false theory called the Aryan Invasion Theory. See, they tried to explain away how the blacks were at the bottom of the total pole and the whites were at the top. And they tell this story about some Aryans coming in and invading India and they the ones who started the caste system. In actuality, it was the Hindu Brahmins who started the caste system. Now, what happened was the Vedas were given credibility. See, there was this German by the name of Max Muller. Now, Max Muller studied Sanskrit, he read the Vedas, and before he could verify the teachings, he just wrote about this theory, and he took this theory of the Vedas as being a fact. Now, what happened was Adolf Hitler was looking to find a religion and Adolf Hitler read about the Aryan invasion theory. So Adolf Hitler adopted the Hindu swastika and he adopted the name Aryan, which is a modified word of Iranian, but he took this Aryan and he came up with the theory of white superiority. Now, please understand that when you check history and the word Hindu, not only does it not exist, the Hindus rewrote world history in Asians via Mahayana Buddhism and they brought it into this new Aaron invasion theory. Please note that you must understand the history of the Gupta king via Karamadiya. He created what was called the Golden Age of Hindu, whereas they made Sanskrit the official language of India. See, under Vikramadiya, they, the whites and the light skins, created this caste system, and you see this new culture of Hinduism, and you do not see black people anymore in India because they created this new age of Hinduism. See, the golden age, it was the Hindu. Uh, via Sanskrit, they rewrote the history, they worked out the black history in India. So when you see these movies and you see the Maharajas and all these people, they had at this time in the AD had subjugated all the black people to a chandela or worse than that of a slave. See, the Hindus put black people at the bottom of the caste system and those who did not agree were put in an outcast outside the caste system. See, the Hindu religion is only about 2,055 years old and 
the Romans rewrote the history and they put the Buddha in the Hindu Hathiyam. Now, let us speak about Southern India. See, in order to get blacks to agree to the racist caste system, they put blacks in the upper caste as kings and some blacks were made Brahmins. You see, so what they did, they negotiated uh, with the blacks and made them in the upper caste and they were able to have some black Brahmins and some blacks in the upper caste. That's how they kept the Southern Indians or the dark Indians. See, let me cite an example. You see, the most noted Southern Indian in regards to Mahayana Buddha was Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna is an example of a Southern Indian who comes from a Brahmin family. Mahayana Buddhism was the Buddhism of the racist Brahmins. Now, when Nagarjuna came along, over a hundred years after Mahayana Buddhism began, see, he grew up supporting the racist caste system. He was born in the upper caste. Another example of prominent black Buddhists was Bodhavama, who introduced Shalom, a Kung Fu channel. He was from the upper caste family. See, let me explain to you about the Buddhism in a 21st century paradigm. Let us look at Black Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Why Clarence Thomas is by outward appearance an African American, however, his mindset is that of a white conservative. Another example is Dr. Ben Carson, a respected surgeon. However, Dr. Carson follows the path of a white conservative system that is not inclusive of the interests, history, and culture of black or African people. Mahayana Buddhism is the antithesis of black Buddhist history. The blacks who support Mahayana Buddhism do not support the true history that explains Buddhist history is black history. I began to practice the Mahayana Zen Buddhist faith in 1970. In 1974, I joined the NSA or Nitrin Shoshu of America Buddhist set that split into Nitrin Shoshu Buddhist set and the SGI Buddhist set. Both of these Buddhist sets are Mahayana Buddhists whereas they extricate all black Buddhist history, culture, and language from their Buddhist teachings. See, the Japanese Nichiren Buddhist sects, the SGI, Nichiren Shoshu, and Nichiren Shu are all Mahayana Buddhists, and they are associated with Sanskrit and Vedic teachings that extricate all black Buddhist teachings. Please note, that it was the 13th century Japanese Buddhist sage Nichiren Shonen who challenged the Mahayana Buddhist country and the Buddhist sects in Japan. Let me cite you an example. Nichiren challenged all the great Buddhist teachers in history, including Nakajuna, the most respected Mahayana Buddhist in history. This is what Nitrin writes in the Ghost Show. It's called The Section of Time. And he writes, quote, question, do you mean to say that Nagarjuna, Van Subandu, and others did not teach the true meaning of the Lava Sutra? Answer, that is correct. Did they not teach it? Question, then what doctrine did they teach? Answer, they taught the doctrines of provisional Mahayana, the various 
exoteric and esoteric teachings such as the flower garden, correct and equal wisdom, and the Ma Varchi Rochana Sutras, but they did not teach the doctrines of the Lotus Sutra. Please understand that the doctrines of the Lotus Sutra runs counter to Asian Buddhist sects like the Hindu, Chinese, and Japanese teachings. See, the Lotus Sutra teaches Kyo or to dispel delusion. You see, what we have in our universe is the vast knowledge. This vast knowledge is called Kyo. When you open your mind to this vast knowledge, this is called Myo. Myo means to open. Myo means wonderful. The word Myo also means correct. We can say Myo means to open to the correct and wonderful Kyo or vast knowledge of our universe. Now, let us get to the word Namu or Nam. For the most part, Namu means devotion. In regards to everyday people, most of us in regards to religion do not like the word devotion. Such words bring fear to our eyes. In that the Christian teachers teach us that God says put no other God before him. Now if someone tells you to devote or devotion, this can be scary. Let us put Namu in a 21st century paradigm. Namu means to awaken. The Buddha said Namu means to be amazed and awaken. The word devotion is a strong word whereas being amazed or awakened is another meaning of the word Namu. We can say Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is being amazed or awakened to the correct and wonderful open to the vast universal cause and effect knowledge or cure. What is the cure or our overcoming delusion? We recognize that Buddhist history is black history. Let me end this lecture by telling you a personal story. I learned that the Buddha was black from reading the book Malcolm X on Afro-American history. This idea caused me decades of pain and suffering. I had no idea why Asians or, or why my Japanese teachers were trying to silence me. My pain caused me to write more and do more lectures on this subject than any human on planet Earth. It was the Buddhist God and the spirit of my ancestors that taught me our black Buddhist history. Not only did I learn that the Buddha was black, but I learned that our ancestors, the Nubians, were Buddhists. I learned that Buddhist history was black history. Now, on January the 8th, 2016, my Ethiopian wife had a son and I named him Sitata Watam after the Buddha. My Buddhist faith took me home to Africa where my ancestors, the Nubians, my dream is to bring my Buddhist family together. Race is a social construct and we all have African heritage. Our joy is to worship our Buddhist faith, inclusive of our Buddhist, of our black culture, history, and language. I am Anthony L. Elmore, President and Founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association, bringing you another exciting Buddhist lecture. Thank you very much.
Max Baby All ancient icons show a simple fact They all show that the Buddha was black I believe in facts and the Kato was wrong Buddha was no Aryan This song saw the history By those who rewrite history Both that so that their souls understand In the thousand years as the Buddha's death His teacher ride in Japan Let me tell you something That makes sense The Buddha's teachings did not start in the Orient those of you make a religious incision, the Buddha's teaching no Asian religion. The Buddha's religion has a lot of mystery. Asian took out all the black Buddhist history. Let me lay on you the history and the facts. Look at the ancient Buddhist statues, is always right. Let me lay this on you all the black Buddhist history and take out all the Buddhist history. The land today they call India, in the old days it was called East.